to the Christians because the Muslim has given his hand look he says Jesus is the Christ the Muslim says that the Muslim says that he was the Messiah he says he was born miraculously that he gave life to the dead by God's permission he healed those born blind and the lepers look the Muslim is giving his hand of friendship again and again and again now this question of yours this good spirit of yours you should spend expend it on your Christian friends ask them that look since a Muslim is coming forward why aren't you prepared to give your hand of acceptance and say, look, we also believe that Muhammad is the messenger of God and you 1,200 million Christians and 1,000 million Muslims get, can get together on a common platform. Now, do that service for mankind. Ask your Christian friends. Ahmed Hussein Didat was born in India on July the 1st in the year 1918. His family resided in the district of Surat. Shortly after his birth, his father Hussein Didat pursued new employment opportunities in the growing economy of South Africa, where he soon found employment as a tailor. Hussein Didat made the difficult yet courageous choice of leaving his infant son Ahmed in the loving and vigilant guardianship of his mother back in India. The young Ahmed would not be reunited with his father until nine years later. When the situation was more favorable and his status had grown more stable, Hussein Didat arranged for his son to join him in South Africa. That was when Ahmed Didat obtained his first passport, which was issued by the British Colonial Administration. Ahmed's journey across the continent was to mark a sequence of curious encounters and exciting new experiences for the nine-year-old adventurer. He traveled to South Africa unaccompanied by any adult on his long and challenging sea voyage. He told me that, Yusuf, it was the first time in my life that I saw the ocean, the sea. It was the first time in my life that I boarded a ship. I never knew what a ship looked like. By the grace of God, the young lad arrived safely in South Africa in August 1927. But just a few days prior to his arrival, the South African government had set a strict and final deadline after which no unaccompanied youngster would be admitted within the borders unless they were accompanied by their mothers. And as fate would have it, Ahmed Didat arrived at Durban's shipping harbour only 24 hours too late. The curfew had expired and the new law had come into full effect. This meant that Ahmed Didat and all the other children on board would have to be repatriated to India unless they were accompanied by their mothers. Unfortunately for Ahmed, he was unaccompanied by any adult, so the authorities were obliged to send him back to India. However, his father was adamant that no such thing would happen. Ahmed's father, 
Hussein Didat was a resolute and firm man who would not take no for an answer. In a moment that would set the course of history for Islam in South Africa, Hussein Didat held onto the tender hand of his nine-year-old son and defiantly walked past the customs officers. By the will of God, Ahmed Didat was the only child that day to have been admitted into the country. All of the others were sent back to India. Hussein Didat found a great admirer in his young son Ahmed. Perhaps his confidence and strength of character had contributed towards the courageous and confident man that this young boy would one day become. Ahmed was enrolled at the Anjuman School in Central Durban. Yet despite the fact that he had never been to school prior to this, the young student soon caught up and surpassed his classmates and went on to become an exemplary student, topping all of his classmates in just six months. Yet his bright prospects and dazzling ambition would be darkened by the dark clouds of separation and loss that engulfed the young hopeful when news of his mother's death reached him in South Africa. Ahmed's mother had only survived a few months following his journey to South Africa. Unbeknown to either of them, they would never come to see one another again in this life. The young Ahmed's emotional losses were soon to take on a financial dimension when he soon found himself shouldering a mountainous load of worries and concern at the tender age of 10 years old. Uncertain as to the future continuation of his studies, the strains from this painful predicament soon became apparent on the face of Ahmed Didat. The traces of concern and stress caught the attention of a local businessman who approached the young boy and reassured him that the school fees would certainly be paid and that he should only return to school and concentrate on his studies. Upon his return to school, Ahmed Didat was confronted by his teachers and his school fees were requested. Upon this request, Ahmed responded full of zeal and confidence that all of his fees were soon to be paid by the generous businessman. However, unbeknown to him at this time, the promises that were made to him were all in jest. In fact, it was a cruel form of entertainment and a vicious string of lies and deception. The businessman told Ahmed that he was only joking. In actuality, he never intended to sponsor the young orphan's education. It was all just a joke. As tragic as this was, the young Ahmed was soon to experience even more hardship when his father was forced to discontinue the school payments and to take him out of school due to the financial struggle they were facing. Like millions of prepubescent boys in that era, the young Ahmed was now obliged to take on a trade. He found his vocation 30 kilometers outside the city of Durban in a quaint local country store known as Adam's Mission Station, which was noticeably positioned opposite the missionary center, a formation center where young African missionaries were being recruited and trained to evangelize the local populations. These students would frequent the shop and begin to preach to Ahmed Didat. They used him as some sort of guinea pig. They tested all of their techniques on the staff at the store, many of whom were Muslim by faith, but were totally clueless as to what this faith actually meant. Seeing this state of vulnerability and susceptibility, the young missionaries would fire various questions and challenge the Muslim shop workers with all sorts of refutation against Islam and against the Prophet Muhammad. 
This routine became continuous and was repeated on a daily basis. The ordeal came to such an extent that despite the difficulty in finding a gainful employment in those days, Ahmed Didat began to seriously consider quitting his job just to escape the constant taunts and challenges from the young missionaries. Knowing little more than the testimony of faith and the few minor details about Islam, Ahmed Didat found himself unable and incapable of defending his own belief. Despite the mounting challenges and attacks on a daily basis, Yet he felt what was a growing desire and an overwhelming inner sentiment that pushed him to seek some sort of enlightenment and clarification regarding these matters. But unbeknown to him, all of the answers he was looking for were to be found right where he was stationed. The enlightening moment was finally unraveled when the young assistant began rummaging through his boss's warehouse in search of more interesting reading material. It was then that he discovered a worm-eaten book that would change the course of his life forever. The book was old and dusty, and upon wiping away the dirt from its covers, the book's title was revealed. It had an Arabic type with the following words inscribed beneath it, Izharul Haq which translates in English as the truth revealed. The book had a publication date of 1915 and was published in India. As if some sort of answer to his quest for information, Ahmed Dida soon realized that the contents of this very book would provide him direct and elaborate answers to all of the questions that were clouding his mind. In fact, the entire book was an account of various encounters between Christian missionaries that had been sent to India to evangelize the gospel and to convert Muslim populations using various strategies and arguments for the cause. The contents of this book also documented various accounts and details of spectacular debates that took place between Muslim scholars and the missionary professors that would challenge them to public debates in the local Urdu language. Fired up with zeal and enthusiasm and the desire to learn and discover, it was in that very hour that Ahmed Didat began to learn the answers that he was so in need of. As he flickered through each page with passion and persistence, his fervor was matched by the depth and brilliance of the arguments and the logical sequences presented by the Muslim author. More than providing a gold mine of information, the book had sparked a deep interest and inspired the young reader to begin a lifelong quest of seeking knowledge and facts about the various religious traditions and manuscripts from an Islamic perspective. But more importantly, the book had reattached him to Islam. He began reading the Holy Quran and memorizing its beautiful verses with all the beautiful explanations while he was conducting his own research into the Bible and the New Testament. He then purchased his first Bible and began taking notes on the verses in his very own notebook. Soon, Ahmed Didat began engaging with the young missionaries that came to the store. And soon, one by one, they would cease to visit the store when they were confronted with the brilliant and logical argument from the young Ahmed. Now motivated and enthusiastic in his position, Ahmed did that left the store and decided to visit a local Bible study class that was being delivered by an English revert to Islam. His name was Mr. Fairfax. Ahmed Didat attended the lectures with enthusiasm and learned much about comparative religion and about biblical sciences. A few months had passed and Mr. Fairfax ceased to attend. The students were saddened by his absence and Ahmed stood in on behalf of the teacher. His style and charisma was so brilliant that he eventually continued teaching the class 
for a further three years. Gone were the days when Ahmed Dida would be swamped by questions and challenges from local missionaries that visited the store. And gone were the days of timid responses and half-hearted attempts to defend his faith. Ahmed Dida now began to challenge the missionaries regarding the validity and veracity of their very own scriptures. This he did skillfully and eloquently with a fluency and authoritative tone that soon drove the missionaries away from the store altogether. Following his successful engagement with the missionaries, Ahmed Dida began to seek a new platform for his thought-provoking questions and his beautiful call to Islam. He pioneered new and unheard of approaches to the traditional means of propagating Islam. He was one of the first proponents to place open adverts in the local English newspapers in defense of Islam. This was indeed unique and unheard of during the British colonial rule. He soon purchased an English translation of the Holy Quran by Yusuf Ali and he began to memorize its chapters and its verses. This was to be the single greatest and most prized investment of Ahmed Dirat. The Quran became an inspiration and he drew all his love and motivation from his luminous and beautiful verses. So we started with advertising the Quran in our local new Sunday newspapers, one called the Sunday Tribune. We advertise Quranic verses under the heading, The Quran Speaks, a message from the Quran, and giving our name and address that further inquiries can be made and for free literature they can write. And then the same thing we started doing for the African people in the Zulu language newspaper called Ilangalasi Natal, mean the son of Natal in which we had Ikuran Yakuluma, which means what the Quran says. And again, the same technique, verses from the Quran translated into Zulu and offering people free information and, and, and uh, literature. Dawah, or the Islamic call to propagation, began to dominate his life. Ahmed Dida was soon invited to Cape Town, where he delivered lectures in huge halls and attracted crowds of over 40,000 spectators. He raised the morale of the Malay people in the Cape region, who had been feeling disillusioned and downtrodden by the dominant Eurocentric culture in South Africa. During his rise to fame, Ahmed Didat was approached by a man known as Haji Kadwa, following one of his open lectures. The wealthy patron extended an open offer of 75 acres of land which would all be donated to Ahmed Dira's organization in order to assist him in his work and development. This came through as a major breakthrough for Ahmed Didat and his administrative team. He seized the opportunity and moved to the south coast of Natal with his family in order to establish and run the new organization which he named as Salam. As Salam was dedicated to teaching comparative religion, the students also learned how to clarify misconceptions and how to deliver the pure teachings of Islam to non-Muslim audiences. We have a dozen different types of literature, all on comparative basis. And we are publishing this literature now 100,000 at a time. We have a book called What the Bible Says About Muhammad. That book, we have done more than 300,000. Then we have another book, Is the Bible God's Word? We have done more than 260,000. And all, crucifixion or crucifixion, Christ in Islam, how Islam solves the racial problem, the Muslim at prayer, and on and on, we are printing these booklets 100,000 at a time for absolutely free distribution. We don't charge anybody. We have so far handled this office of mine some 85,000 Holy Quran translations, Arabic text, translation and commentary, which we have been selling and what returns we get gets plowed back into propagation and we have also been giving out these Qurans we have been offering to 
free, free, free to every school, college, university, and public library, absolutely free of charge. To every mosque and madrasa, absolutely free of charge. And we have handled so far about 85,000. We have just placed an order now for another 100,000 for helping our brethren all over the world. For example, I'm sending 10,000 Qur'ans to our Afro-American brethren in America. I want to help the people in Sri Lanka and in India, Pakistan, in the UK. We want to do this, that the Qur'an is made available, freely available at a very low price, subsidized cost, or even free. And 100,000 are now, inshallah, under print. But by 1973, As-Salam had run out of steam and Ahmed Dida was confronted with dwindling financial resources and an overstretched workload. As-Salam had not been developed into the multinational development agency that was originally envisioned. So after 17 years of faithful service and continuous effort towards the project, Sheikh Ahmed Dida cordially resigned from his post as a leading authority in as -Salam. However, where a door was shut, a window of opportunity was opened for the Sheikh. He soon found himself immersed in the development of a new and more ambitious project. The Islamic Propagation Center International, or the IPCI, was subsequently founded and directed by Ahmed Dirat in the weeks and months that followed his resignation from as -Salam. Here he aimed at internationalizing the Dawah to reach a broader audience and to make a far greater impact. The Sheikh soon realized his international ambition when he set off for his first trip to the Arab world in 1976. He was accompanied by a close friend of his, Ibrahim Jadwat. The two of them traveled to Riyadh for an Islamic conference. Ibrahim attended the conference with the intention to elicit some interest in Ahmed Dirat and his work at the time. But at the time he was very little known in the Arab world. So upon prompting some Arab journalists to interview Ahmed Dirat, Ibrahim was met with indifference and a genuine lack of concern. Some even laughed and noted that with so many famous sheikhs in Saudi Arabia, what need did they have to interview an unknown man from South Africa? But driven by a tenacious and tireless conviction in Ahmed Dida's unique talents, Ibrahim Jadwat eventually convinced the Saudi broadcasters to interview Ahmed Dida for two minutes. The rest, as they say, is all history. Sheikh Ahmed Dida, with his engaging approach, his dynamic personality and his deep encyclopedic knowledge of Christian quotes and Bible references had swept the Arab world off his feet. Going to Riyadh opened up many doors for him and his dream of printing and distributing the Quran and other literature soon became a reality. <laughs> ولا تستوي الحسنة ولا السيئة تدفع بالتي هي أحسن فإذا الذي بينك وبينه عداوة كأنه ولي حميم أحمد ديرات was a pioneer of contemporary mass dawa. He was ahead of his time in his diverse strategies to deliver the message of Islam to a modern audience. He directly challenged the Christian missionary movements in the Muslim world and he began to pave the way for a new generation of Muslim thinkers and activists. His tireless efforts to propagate the pristine message of Islam resulted in many outstanding achievements even during his lifetime. The IPCI printed thousands of noble Qur'ans which were being distributed worldwide. His organization printed various books and titles and they produced lengthy cassettes which were being circulated across the globe. But perhaps Ahmed Dida was most known for his groundbreaking lectures which were organized and delivered worldwide. 
the most unjust thing to do. Can you imagine you go and commit all the crimes in the world and we catch the most innocent man that we can find and hang him? You think God Almighty is such, is such a person, is such a being that for Adam's sin, Adam and Eve, they ate the fruit and now he's going to put everybody into hell and he's going to take his own son, an innocent child, who had done no wrong and have him hanged and his poor man doesn't want to die, he's crying, sweating blood and you know, never mind hook or by crook, get him hanged. Is that God? Is that a loving God? You are a loving father to your child, I take it, if you have any children. And for somebody coming on committing a crime in your house, you go and kill your child for somebody else's crime? <laughs> is that what you do? Because you love this criminal so much, all these sinners. <laughs> Next man. Next man. In November 1986, Sheikh Ahmed Dida's greatest debate was anticipated on both sides of the Atlantic. He had agreed to participate in a historic debate with the American missionary and famous televangelist, the Reverend Jimmy Swaggart. The debate was entitled, Is the Bible the Word of God? It was to be held in Jimmy Swaggart's hometown of Baton Rouge in Louisiana. The event was much anticipated and attracted a huge audience. In fact, Ahmed Dida's bold and daring challenge in the Reverend's hometown was foreseen by some people as being almost Davidian against the Galician powerhouse that was Reverend Jimmy Swaggart. do have something to shout about because Jesus won the heavyweight championship of the world when he knocked the devil through the ropes 2,000 years ago by the shedding of his precious blood. He is victorious. He is king. He is all power. He's a mighty power. He's a mighty fortress. He's a mighty buckler. He's a mighty shield. He's the prince of peace, the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. Jesus, 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 Jesus. A man who headed a $100 million missionary station and one of the largest evangelist churches in the world. In fact, the odds were stacked so heavily against Sheikh Ahmed Didat that his very own son, Yusuf Didat, began to dissuade his father from even debating Jimmy Swaggart. Everything he spoke, oh, we should make us cry. And I should tell him, the way he should move, I should tell my dad, be careful, daddy, don't take this guy on. You could take the world on, but don't take this guy on. The psychologist, your answer is not the psychiatrist. Your answer is not a pill bottle. Your answer is not in more therapy or counseling. Your answer is the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed at Calvary 2,000 years ago. And one day I heard that he booked a ticket to America to go and debate with Jimmy Swaggart. And believe me, my brothers and sisters, I came home shivering, wallah, thinking that dude, this is one day that my father is going to lose. But the date was set, the tickets were sold out, and the anticipation was sky high. Not only did this mark one of the most famous interfaith encounters in modern day history, but it was a pivotal moment in the Muslim world. It was the point at which a confrontation between the East and the Western ideological struggle came to the meeting of minds. The debate on whether the Bible was the veritable word of God had come to symbolize a debate of epic proportions. The event was renamed the Great debate. Mr. Didot mentioned the Douay version of the Bible. Sir, we do believe in the Douay version of the Bible. Translation, let's put it that way. We do not accept those spurious books that were mentioned, but we do believe in the Douay translation. We feel it's a good translation. 
No one has to believe in a particular translation of the Bible to be saved. You do have to believe in the Word of God to be saved. And once again, the Word of God says, there is none other name under heaven. It also tells us that we are saved by faith not by works, lest any man should boast. We're saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't care where that word is. If the word of God, do you have a Quran over there, sir? Could I? I mean, I was hoping he brought one. <laughs> okay. Any word of God that's in this book, if you believe it, pertaining to salvation, you will be saved. You follow what I'm saying? If the Word of God pertaining to salvation, pertaining to being redeemed, pertaining to being saved, if it's written on the side of a wall somewhere, to be frank with you, it's written on our hearts. That's what the Bible tells us. You can Memorize this book and worship it, and it won't save you. It has no power to save you. But the Word of God, if adhered to, and that means accepting Jesus Christ as one's own personal Savior. If that is in the Quran, you can be saved. Mr. d -Dad. How does the Muslim account for different versions of the Qur'an? Does this make all of the versions um, lies as you claim the Bible is? I repeat, there is no such thing as different versions of the Qur'an. I said there are translations. Yours are versions. Brother Swaggart, in the previous question he ans uh, answered, he said, look, there are seven spurious books in the Dua version. Seven spurious means which he rejects. So it's a version. There are seven books out of this which he is not prepared to accept as the word of God. Whereas every Quran in the world translated as it is God's word translated. And you have a choice of words, but they are not versions. This is a version. This is a version. Chunks and chunks are thrown out from what is in here. Different version. I hope you understand my English. You know, I don't know how, how, how simpler I can put it to you. That the things are varying. What is in here? Seven books? Not in here. What is in here is not in there. What is in here is taken out from there again. Can you see? It's a version. I hope. I don't know. Reverend Jimmy Swaggart, what is Trinity? We believe the Word of God teaches that there is one God, not 2, 5, 10, 12, 15, one manifest in three persons, three different personalities. We believe there is a Heavenly Father, we believe there is God the Son, and we believe the Holy Ghost, as Mr. D. Dot mentioned, that came upon Mary, is also God. They are indivisible meaning they agree perfectly. They are one in unity. They never disagree. They never have disagreed. We believe that when you get to heaven, if you get there, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, will be seated according to the Word of God by the right hand of the Father and will actually maintain that throne forever, basically. That's what we mean by the Trinity in a short nutshell. We have a time exactly for two more questions. Mr. Didat, do you believe in the Holy Ghost? Why or why not? You see, the idea of the Holy Ghost in Christendom is that he's one in a trinity. But the Christian says that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. But they are not three gods, but one God. 
in his catechism, he continues that the Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty, and the Holy Ghost is Almighty. But there are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. It continues, your catechism. It says the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person. That's what Brother Swagger says in his book. Person, person, person. But not three person, but one person. I am asking what language are you speaking? I am asking, is that English? By God, it is gibberish, it's not English. You see, you said person, 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 but not three person, but one person. I said, Brother Swagat, you and your two other brothers, let's say you are three identical triplets, and we can't make the difference out between the three of you. They're all identical. We can't make out the difference. If one of you commit murder, can we hang the other? You say no. I'm asking, why not? So you tell me that he's a different person. I said, right. What makes him different? His personality. So the father, you know, imagination, the human mind, you can't help. When you use words, they conjure up mental pictures. When you say in the name of the father, you have a certain mental picture of that old father Christmas, Santa Claus, millions and millions of times bigger than man, but something like a man sitting on some planet with his feet dangling onto the earth at his footstool, the heaven as his canopy, the loving father in heaven. When you say God the son, I'm asking, are you thinking of a prize bull or a false one? No, you're thinking of a handsome young man, blonde hair, blue eyes, handsome features. Something like what you saw in the King of Kings, Jesus of Nazareth, you know, uh, on the day of crime where Jeffrey Hunter was acting, Handsome young man, blonde hair, blue eyes, handsome features, nice beard, not with a poly nose, with a crooked nose. That might make other pictures come into your mind. You know, Shakespeare made Shylock famous. Is it Shylock? Shylock? No. You see, so you're thinking of somebody like an Englishman or a Nordic or a German type with a straight nose, the sun. And the Holy Ghost, something that came like a dove. When Jesus was baptized in the river Jordan by John the Baptist, or something that came in flames of fire at Pentecost. I said, the picture is not very vivid, but the picture is there. You have three distinct mental pictures. And however hard you try, you can never superimpose those three pictures and create one. There will ever be three in your mind. But when I ask you how many pictures you see, you say one. You are lying to me. Brothers and sisters, you are lying to me. The outcome of this momentous debate took the entire world by surprise and had overwhelmed countless spectators across the world. By the will of God, Shah Ahmed Dira defeated the seasoned American evangelist in a captivating exchange of words and an eloquent presentation of evidence and logical deduction in support of the Muslim perspective. The outcome of this debate propelled Ahmed Didat to new heights in his career. He was soon to be swept up in a whirlwind of tours, visiting and lecturing in numerous countries. With his new status and achievement in the field of Islamic propagation, Ahmed Didat's organization, the IPCI, expanded its activities and its premises, moving to a larger building and servicing a growing global audience. In 1986, the Saudi administration awarded Ahmed Didat by honoring him with the prestigious King Faisal International Prize for Service of Islam. Ahmed Didat's style and charisma influenced a new generation of Muslim thinkers and defenders of the faith. Perhaps one of the most prominent students of the late Sheikh is Dr. Zakir Naik, who owes a great debt of gratitude to the late Sheikh. I would like to give an example of the man, of the person, who had very small means, but reached the heights in his field. The man, the person who changed my life 
and converted me from a doctor of a body to a doctor of soul. And I'm sure you know the name of, of that man. He's none other than Sheikh Ahmed Didad. At the height of his fame and influence, Sheikh Ahmed Dida was in contact with several world leaders and men of influence. He was reported to have even received a personal call from the late president, Nelson Mandela, who happened to be on a state visit to Saudi Arabia at the time. The president had called Ahmed Didat to congratulate him for his achievement in the Muslim world. And in 1984, Sheikh Ahmed Didat even challenged the Pope to a public debate in the Vatican Square, but the Pope declined the invite. His Holiness the Pope is busy. And he is the head of 850 million Roman Catholics. His Holiness the Pope. And His Holiness the Pope has just made a proclamation. You get this morning star and you read there, he is making his wish known to the world that he wants to have a dialogue with the Muslims. Dialogue. You know what's a dialogue? A friendly chat, an exchange of views, communication between one group of people and another, in this particular instance, with the Muslims. Now you have to inform this to people. His Holiness the Pope, he wants to have a dialogue. Wherever he goes, he wants to have a dialogue with the Muslims. But suppose His Holiness was here today with us. I would have, in all humility, approached him. Your Holiness, the Quran tells us to have a dialogue with you. Ta'ala, ta'ala. Allah tells us to call them ta'ala, ta'ala. And in the book of Isaiah, also the Holy Bible tells you, come, let us reason together. Come. Let us reason together. So we are going to have a little dialogue. Though I had tried to have a dialogue with him, I had written to him, but unfortunately it didn't come about. Sheikh Ahmed Didat was the father of modern day interfaith dialogue and debate within the Muslim world. His world tours guaranteed packed auditoriums and energized countless communities to defend their faith once more in the most eloquent and convincing of ways by simply understanding and quoting the luminous verses of the Noble Quran. Just when his fame grew to wondrous proportions and his following began to grow internationally, the Sheikh's career came to an abrupt stop in 1996 when he delivered his last lecture in Sydney, Australia. The lecture was considered to be one of his most passionate talks ever delivered. On May the 3rd, 1996, Sheikh Ahmed Dira suffered a severe stroke known as Locke's Syndrome. The effect of this stroke left him paralyzed from the neck down. He was no longer able to speak or swallow. In fact, concerns grew so high that several doctors began to inform the Didat family that the great man had only 10 days to live. Upon receiving this devastating news, Yusuf Didat, the son of Ahmed Didat, returned home and began to make a series of urgent calls to his contacts in Saudi Arabia. Following a number of urgent calls, Ahmed Didat was taken to Saudi Arabia on a medical jet. It was dispatched by the Saudi royal family. Ahmed Dida spent the following 10 months in a highly specialized unit at the King Faisal Hospital in Riyadh, where he was trained to use special machines to communicate with eye movements. The Saudi government had even appointed a specialist neurologist from Germany to take care of Ahmed Dida. Following his return home from Saudi Arabia, Ahmed Dida spent the next nine years of his life bed-bound in his South African home. Sheikh Ahmed Dida's greatest battle came to an end on August the 8th, 2005, when the disease had totally weakened his body and eventually claimed his life.
اسماعيل بن موسى منك مفتي زيمبابوي الشيخ احمد ديدات الفقيد رجل كان معروف في العالم الاسلامي وحتى في العالم كله وخدم الاسلام والمسلمين بطريقه غير مسبوقه يعني سبحان الله بين مواضع الاختلاف والاتفاق بين الاديان بين الاسلام والنصرانيه واليهوديه مواضع الاتفاق والاختلاف كذلك والحمد لله انتقل إلى رحمة الله اليوم نقول إن لله وإنا إليه راجعون مآثره عظيمة كبيرة جدا وأنا أنصح جميع المستمعين أن يعني يأخذوا أو يشتروا من السيديهات الموجودة في العالم أجمع ويسمعوها أو يشوفوها سواء كانت مرئية أو مسموعة ويستفيدوا منها لأنه بين مواضع ضعف الأديان الأخرى وقوة الإسلام ومواضع يعني الأخطاء في في الإنجيل والتحريف بينها وكان يحفظ الإنجيل يرحمه الله حفظا يعني أحفظ من الباب في الفاتيكان والقصة المعروفة لدى الجميع أن الباب يوحنا الثاني الذي مات الذي يعني قبل فترة لم يأتي إلى جنوب أفريقيا إلا بعدما مرض الشيخ أحمد لأن الشيخ أحمد قال له إذا أتيت إلى جنوب أفريقيا لا بد من مناظرة وكان البابا هذا معروف أنه كان يخاف من هذه المناظرة لأنه ما من شخص ناظر أحمد ديدات إلا ويعني تقريبا نستطيع نقول هزم في في جميع المناظرات فلذلك يعني ننصح الجميع أن يدرسوا يعني ما قدمه الشيخ هذا للاسلام والمسلمين والكثير والكثير من الناس دخلوا الاسلام على يديه. وانا اعرف حتى في مالاوي وزيمبابوي وبعض الدول يسمعون شرائطه وينظرون الى هذه المناظرات ويدخلون في الاسلام مباشره. فالحمد لله يعني له خدمه خدم الاسلام والمسلمين بشكل عجيب. وكما تشوف اليوم الجم الغفير اظن في جنوب افريقيا يعني هذا عدد عدد يعتبر عدد هائل كبير جدا لحضور جنازه مثل هذه فالحمد لله على ذلك وفي نفس الوقت ندعو الله عز وجل ان يرسله الفتوح بالناس The legacy of Sheikh Ahmed Hussein Didat extends towards the entire Muslim ummah thousands of people from across South Africa participated in the funeral of Sheikh Ahmed Didat. They came from near and far 
to pay their final respects to the man who had made them proud once again. A man who at a time when the Muslim community had everything going against it. He single-handedly raised their morale and made them proud to be Muslims again. A man whose voice, courage and conviction served as a piercing ray of light amidst the blinding shadows of confusion, doubt and ignorance. May Allah grant Sheikh Ahmed Didat a most beautiful and ready audience in the high palaces of paradise. Look, you can change the people. Wallah, and I tell you, this is the destiny of Islam, to change this country. You have it, Allah has given it to us. He's telling us in the Quran, he's given you a deen. He's the liyuzay hirahu ala deena kulli. Is to master, overcome and supersede every other deen, every other way of life. Whether it be Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianism, Communism, every ism, Islam is destined to master them all. No mind how much the unbeliever might not like it. And he repeats the same formula in the Quran again. And he ends by saying, Walau karihal mushrikun. Now my heart, the mushrik might not like it. This is the destiny of his deen. And he repeats the same formula again in the Quran three times. He says, Huwa allazi arsala rasulahu bil huda. He it is who has sent his messenger with guidance. Wa deen al haq. And with the religion of truth. Li yuzi hira huwa la deen kulli. That it may prevail, overcome and supersede every other deen. Bulldoze them all. Wa kafa billahi shaheed. And enough is Allah is a witness to this fact that he's going to make his deen to prevail with you or without you. Open the Quran, read the Quran, and let Allah speak to you. <laughs> Allah will do it for you. Allow his book to touch you, your heart. And inshallah, allow Allah to talk to you. And he's talking to you in the Quran. He's talking to you and me and to every passerby in the street. Let him talk to you. And you will not be able to sit on your backside doing nothing. Waiting for the other people to come and mess, make a mess of you. To use you as a punching bag. To use you as a doormat. To want to make mess in your head. Is that the role? Allah says no. And enough is Allah is a witness to this fact. That he's going to make his deen to prevail. It's a privilege Allah is giving you. Take it. Yeah, I'm